as I've already said, we uh, we didn't even plan this, but I was going to start the same way by saying that um, we say at the Seder, Behold Dor Vador Chayav Adam Lerot et Atzmo, Ki Ilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim. So through our program tonight, through our virtual tour and looking at ancient Egyptian artifacts, I hope that we will be able to um, do that um, at our um, uh, Sedarim this year. So I just want to um, explain what we're going to be doing tonight so everyone has an idea of timing. My program will go for about an hour and it will be a mix of a virtual tour enhanced with um, um, images of museum artifacts and um, also Tanakh sources. At the end of my program, I'm happy to stay on if anyone has any questions or comments. If you have questions during the program and you think you might forget them, just put them in the chat. I'm not going to look at them during the program because I don't want to break up the flow. And I also know some people like to hear questions and some people um, would rather not. So I leave all the questions and comments for the end and um, I'll do my program for the first part. So we're gonna start off here with um, a screen share. Okay, so we are all now in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is where I work. And um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is a comprehensive museum, has over 2 million works of art. And the ancient Egyptian collection, we have about 30,000 objects in the ancient Egyptian collection, which is a lot of objects, although the British Museum has over 80,000. And of course, in the museums in Egypt, there are um, hundreds of thousands of ancient Egyptian artifacts. So how are there so many artifacts? Um, the ancient Egyptians have a, had a strong belief in the afterlife and many people, pharaohs, but other people as well, um, were buried with objects that they believed that they would need when they came back to life. So uh, with that introduction, we're gonna go to our first um, image. And with this picture as a background, this is a picture that was taken in 1920. It's an archaeological site in Egypt. So we'll start with this as a background to my introduction of how the museum has 30,000 objects from ancient Egypt. So in the early 1900s, um, the Egyptian government invited archaeologists from around the world, including archaeologists from various museums, to come and um, set up archaeological digs in Egypt. Um, and they said, they had a very generous proviso where they said that half of what the archaeologists found they could bring back to their museums and half would stay in Egypt. Now it's been an it's interesting conversation. The system was called partage. Partage means, it's a French word, means to share. And basically they would be sharing the objects and sharing the archaeological expertise. So there are many ways to view this. A lot of people see it that it was um, ben beneficial for both the archaeologists, um, host countries, and for Egypt. Other people view, feel that it was a system of um, colonialism. Um, it was something that happened in the 19, early 1900s, again, with the permission of the Egyptian government. It doesn't happen anymore. Um, the Met still does send archaeologists to Egypt, even right now, the archaeologists there, but they just go on educational um, um, it's an educational experience. They don't, they don't bring objects back anymore. But because of that situation that was uh, known as partage, um, the Met and many museums around the world all over the country ended up with many, many objects from ancient Egypt. And of course, it was beneficial for both the museums who got all these objects, but also for the Egyptians who were able to use the expertise of archaeologists from around the world. So with that background, we're going to uh, start looking at some of our artifacts. So this is the, a picture from 1920 that the archaeologists from the museum took. They, were, they had set up an archaeological dig site here, and they came across an unbelievable discovery. They found the tomb of a man named Meket Ray. Uh, Meket Ray was not a pharaoh, but he was a very important official in ancient Egypt. He lived, uh, well, he, he died in the 1980s BCE. So we're talking almost four. 4,000 years before the archaeologists were here. So when he, uh, he was buried, obviously, with a lot of objects because he felt like he needed them when he came back to, uh, to life. Now, soon after he was buried, um, his grave was, his tomb was invaded by grave robbers, which was, uh, happened a lot in ancient Egypt because everyone is aware that the pharaohs and uh, people were buried with a lot of stuff, including gold and silver and furniture. So many times grave robbers did invade graves. For some reason, the grave robbers missed two rooms in this tomb. We don't know why they missed those two rooms, but they missed two rooms. Um, and those two rooms were untouched until the Met archaeologists discovered these two rooms in 1920. So 
the grave robbers lost was certainly the Metropolitan Museum of Art's gain. So I'm going to show you a picture. Again, this picture was taken in 1920 when the archaeologists opened that tomb, that the room of that tomb for the first time. So uh, if you take a couple of seconds to look at this picture, you might be able to figure out a couple of things that were found in this room in Mechet Ray's tomb. You might notice there are a number of models. These are wooden models that again were made uh, in the 1980s BCE, almost 4,000 years earlier. And they're wooden models. You might be able to see they're wooden models of boats, um, a number of boats, there are wooden models of people, there are wooden models of animals. Um, don't worry, we're going to look at these much clearer, how they look in the museum, but I wanted you to get an idea of what they looked like uh, upon discovery. Now, even though there was no one, there had been no one in this tomb since it was sealed uh, almost 4,000 years earlier, of course, because of the um, earthquakes and earth movements over time, especially in the area that Egypt lies, um, they did get a little bit um, uh, mixed up and jumbled together. Um, but this is, so this is exactly how the archaeologists saw it when they entered Mechet Ray's tomb. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to go into the museum. We're going to go into the Metropolitan Museum of Art because I want you to see what these models look like in the museum. So we're now in the Met together in one of my favorite rooms in the museum. Some of you might have been here before. If you haven't, I would suggest when you're comfortable coming to the museum to come visit this very special space. So uh, as I said, the room that we looked at the of the Mechet Ray models, there were 24 wooden models in the tomb. There were 12 boat models, six of which you see against this back wall. And there were 12 models of Mechet Ray's estate, five of which you can see in these glass cases. Now, um, you might be thinking, I can't see these things so clearly. Uh, and that's not my computer or yours. But the this um, virtual tour technology was developed in 2010 by the museum, which at that time was the forefront of uh, virtual technology. But today, 10 years later, it is not as uh, cutting edge and they haven't updated it. So it will give us an idea and a feel for the room. And for the details, we will I will show you much clearer pictures. But I want you to just be able to see these boats. As I said, they're all made out of wood. They are models of boats that Mechet Ray owned during his life. Of course, he couldn't be buried with his boats because they were too big. So instead, he had his artists and artisans uh, and slaves prepare his boats, prepare everything for his tomb, so that when he came back to life in the afterlife, he would have these boats with them. So here are six boats. Um, and then just moving around the room, you can see on the wall is the text, uh, the story that I'm telling you, the ancient models from the tomb of Mechet Ray, some of the pictures we are looking at, the picture we are just looking at, which is blown up. And then these over here on the left are uh, models of Mechet Ray's estate, which we will look at in close detail in a few minutes. So again, I just wanted everyone to get a feel for this room, to see the size of these models, and to see how these models really bring Mechet Ray's life and life in ancient Egypt um, uh, that we can really um, observe and visualize this. Okay, so now we're going to go back to my images. So we can see some of these boats as they look in the museum in color and close up. Okay, so here's one of Mechet Ray's boats. Now, why were, Me why were boats so important in Egypt and why did Mechet Ray want to be buried with his boats? So as I said, Mechet Ray was an important official in ancient Egypt. He owned many boats um, for trade, for travel along the Nile River. Um, uh, the Nile River uh, then and today was the longest river in the world. It runs through about 10 countries. And in ancient Egypt, it was really their source of travel and trade. And so uh, Mechet Ray had boats that he used to travel on the Nile River. Here we see, this is actually Mechet Ray. He's sitting under the awning. He's the only person on the boat who's not working. Everybody else is working. You'll notice that everybody else are slaves. And this shows us that there was a large class of uh, slaves in ancient Egypt. Now, these were not Israelite slaves because, as I said, these boats were made in the 1980s BCE. Um, and the earliest date that um, that scholars put the Israelites in Egypt was probably 1650 BCE. So these 
uh, models are from 300 years before that, but it does give us an idea that there were many slaves in ancient Egypt because whenever Egypt conquered a country, they would often take those people over as slaves. Um, we also see from these boats how, what boats looked like in ancient Egypt, how they would steer a boat. We can see the, the paddle back here. Um, the steering oar. We can also see this guy in the front who's holding something in his hand. He would dip that in the Nile River to see how um, high the Nile River was. We know that the Nile River was sometimes very high, sometimes very low, and it had to be a certain height for boats to be able to get through. Now in ancient Egypt, they believed that their gods controlled everything, including the Nile River. And if the gods were angry at them, there wasn't enough water. Um, and if the gods were happy with them, there was enough water for everything they needed. Now, of course, the Nile River was the most important um, source in ancient Egypt of water. It gave them their drinking water, their bathing water, their uh, water to water the crops, agricultural water. And of course, it was their source of trade and travel. The Nile River also was what allowed the Egyptians to become really the first um, permanently settled society. Most, many ancient cultures were nomadic because they had to travel around where there was water and where there was rain. But because of the Nile River, the Egyptians could settle there and be a permanent society, <laughs> which was very important. So this is all an important lead up, of course, to thinking about, uh, of course, the uh, story of uh, Pesach, the Pesach Seder, and the first plague, which was a plague of blood. So I think we always think of the plague of blood of Dom to be very devastating because it turned the drinking water to blood and the bathing water and the water for the crops. But it also turned to blood the Egyptians' source of trade and travel. It was their uh, lifeline to the rest of the world. It was part of important part of the economy. So for them to see it turn to blood would have been very, very devastating. And I think that these models really bring that to life. Now we're looking at Meket Ray's models, but of course we have many models of boats in ancient Egypt. We also have many paintings that have boats in them. So boats were very important. So here we have one of Meket Ray's uh, traveling boats. I wanna show you uh, two more boats. Um, this one is, if you take a minute to look at it, you might figure out what this boat is. This is Meket Ray's fishing and fowling boat. So you can see that they did spear fishing in ancient Egypt. Uh, they caught ducks and other animals. Um, again, Meket Ray is the only one who's sitting, not doing any work. This also tells us that there was quite a uh, hierarchical society in Egypt and a separation of the classes. Um, and again, the importance of boats and the fact that there were so many, uh, such a large class of slaves in ancient Egypt. And our last boat is actually another travel boat, but this one is a boat that was used specifically to travel to the afterlife. We know that because here we have Meket Ray sitting. He's um, holding a lotus flower to his lips. Lotus flower was a sign of the afterlife. And in ancient Egypt, they believed that they would travel to the afterlife by boat. So boats were very, very important to them, as you will see in um, some paintings that we'll look at later. Also notice these are wooden models, they're painted wooden models, but a lot of them are wearing linen. Linen was uh, the, the material that clothing was made out of, that uh, the uh, mummification process was used uh, using uh, linen, a very important material. And as you're looking at this, remember that everything is um, f about 4,000 years old, um, but it was you know, found in an airtight tomb. So wood in an airtight tomb can really stay for a long time. Um, okay, so now we also saw in that room, there were models of Meket Ray's estate. Uh, I show them to in glass cases, but we couldn't see the details. So now we're gonna get to see the unbelievable details. So here's the first model that we're looking at. Take a minute just to look at it, see if you can figure out what's going on in this model. Um, while you're doing that, I'm just gonna show you a bird's eye view of the same exact model so we can see it a little bit clearer. Um, and many of you might've figured out that this is a model of Meket Ray's slaughterhouse. Um, so this is a very important model uh, and these models really bring um, ancient Egyptian life to life. Um, so here we have people who are slaughtering cows. We see they hang up the meat to dry and they collect the blood over here in the corner. So what do we? What can we learn from this model? How can we relate this to the Israelite experience? So first of all, many people believe that they didn't eat meat in ancient Egypt because they worshiped animals. So uh, that's actually not, uh, not entirely correct. People did eat meat in ancient Egypt. It was expensive. So only the upper class people could eat meat like Meket, right? But meat was eaten and we will see this 
uh, first of all, we see this through a visit visualization, right? Mecca Ray has a slaughterhouse for them to prepare his meat, but we'll also see it from some of our sources. The other thing that we see here is the um, visualization of the role of a taskmaster, right? So we learn about the taskmaster. We'll talk about that um, in the Haggadah, and I'll, I'll show you a source for that. So here we have the slaves who are slaughtering the animal, but we also have the taskmasters who are making sure the slaves are doing their work. And look, it's very visual. We can see this taskmaster has his uh, a, a spear on the slave's shoulder, making sure that he is doing his work. So again, bringing the experience of the Israelites in Egypt uh, um, to life through these visualizations. Okay, so let's look at our first source here. So this is a source from Shmot. And um, this is going, this is when um, the um, Israelites are, um, they're in the desert and they're complaining about the lack of food. So um, it says, so the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hands of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we ate our fill of bread. So what does this tell us? This tells us al sir habasar, there was meat in Egypt. I'm not sure if the slaves were eating meat because it was very expensive, but there was meat that was eaten in Egypt, okay? And it also tells us what's the other important food that they're talking about. They're talking about meat and they're talking about lechem, bread. So this shows us how important bread was in ancient Egypt. It was, the, that's the food that the, that the Israelites in the desert are remembering, bread. Now, bread was a very important food in ancient Egypt, and we're, gonna, we're going to develop that idea. But it happened to be a food that they uh, gave, they, they paid slaves in bread. That was something that they used to pay the slaves. So it was a, um, very much connected to slavery bread. Um, and it was also very much connected to being a a permanent society. As I said, Egypt, when they settled, Egypt, uh, the Egyptians settled around the Nile River, they became a permanent society, not a nomadic culture. And bread is really a symbol of a permanent food, a food of a settled culture, because you have to have time to prepare the bread and to let it rise. And, and we'll see that it's a, a long process. So we have two symbols of bread here as bread that was fed to slaves. It was their, their wages and also bread as a as a food of a settled society. There's actually a very interesting book. It's called 6,000 Years of Bread. Um, and the author talks about how Egypt was actually the first society to make bread. And again, it's because they were a, a society that was settled around the Nile River and they were settled there permanently. Okay, so let's see a little bit of a background of this bread through our next visualization. So this is um, one of my favorite artifacts probably in the entire collection. Um, and you know, take a couple seconds to look at it, see if you can figure out what it is. Um, and I love this very detailed model. Again, as you're looking at all these things, remember they were made 4,000 years ago, which is unbelievable. Um, as I'm talking, you might've figured out this, this is an ancient Egyptian granary. Okay, so this is showing us exactly what a granary looked like in ancient Egypt. This is Meket Ray's granary, but it gives us an idea of what a granary looked like in Egypt. So first of all, we have these two uh, people, these two men sitting here, and they're recording how much grain comes in and how much grain comes out. And then we have the people here who have collected the grain in, in the field. They're bringing it into the granary with sacks on their back going up the stairs, and they're dumping their grain into these pits over here. Now, these pits, um, actually had, Mecca Ray was buried with actual pieces of grain. How do we know that? Because even though no people were in this room in Mecca Ray's tomb, apparently rats did get into this room. And when the archeologists came in, they found rat droppings just in these um, uh, areas of the granary, which meant there were rats in here and they had eaten some of the grain and uh, left behind um, their, their droppings. So grain was so important in ancient Egypt that not only did Mekere and people of a higher class have their own granaries, but Mekere even wanted to be buried with actual grain, not you know models of grain for when he came back to the afterlife. Now, why was grain so important in ancient Egypt? Of course, it was important because it was used to make bread. Um, and uh, we'll look at that also, but it was, it was also a commodity, right? So if we think about the story of Yosef's brother coming down to Egypt when there was a famine and they had money, but uh, they needed to buy grain, right? So if you have money and there's no food to buy, then your money's not really worth very much. But the, so the money was traded for grain. So grain was used as a commodity in ancient Egypt. It was very important. And of course, we know that from the story of Yosef. 
So Yosef was in charge of a granary for all of, you know, for Egypt. He was a second in command to Paro in charge of Egypt's granary. Uh, we can imagine that the granary for Egypt looked like this, but was much bigger. And of course, we know that Yosef kept track of the grain or he had people keeping track of it because they had to store it for the seven years of plenty so that they would have grain for the seven years of famine. Okay, so now let's look and see what did they make out of this grain. And again, we have a Mecca Ray model to see this uh, visualization. So here, as you're looking at it, you might have figured out what's going on on the right side. They're making the grain into bread. And of course, we, we talked about why bread was so important and how it, uh, um, how it showed that Egypt was a settled permanent society and how they used it to pay their slaves. So here they're making bread on the right side. On the left side, they're putting grain in these urns, in these jugs, I should say, and adding water to it from the Nile River. And I'm sure many of you know, when you mix um, fermented grain with water, you will get beer. And beer actually was not a um, alcoholic drink in ancient Egypt. It was, uh, it was a regular drink. Perhaps that's how they made the Nile River taste a little better by making it into beer. But so here we see Mecat Ray's bakery and his brewery. And I just wanna show you a bird's eye view of the same exact model. So you really see the details of how they took the grain, they, uh, they ground it up, ground up the grain with these uh, tools, they added water to it, they, they formed it into bread, they let it rise, they would bake it. So it was a whole process. And of course, this is Mecca Ray's greenery, but uh, Paro certainly, uh, Paro would have had a, a, his own greenery, his own bakery. Um, and we know that from some sources that we're gonna look at next. So we have sources here from Brashit, um, and we're familiar with the story of Paro, Vayiktov Paro al Shnei Sarisav, al Sar HaMashkim, ba al Sar HaOfim, right? So Paro was angry with his chief cupbearer and his chief baker. So of course, bread being such an important food in ancient Egypt, of course, Paro would have his chief baker and uh, his chief cupbearer who um, was you know, in charge of his wine, um, or maybe his beer was a little bit more alcoholic, but certainly we see the importance of grain that Paro would have a chief baker. Um, and then, of course, we see the source that we've been talking about and referring to about Yosef. So Yosef gathered all the grain of the seven years that the land of Egypt was enjoying and stored the grain in the cities. He put in each city the grain of the fields around it. So we talked about, you know, Yosef storing the grain and recording it. Interestingly, uh, in Hebrew, it calls it ochel, right? We keep seeing the word ochel, and the English translation is grain. So in ancient Egypt, um, grain equaled food. You know, today when you say the word food, you probably think of many, many things, but here the word food was translated as grain. Grain was so important that it was, you know, the, the main food of um, ancient Egyptian society. Okay, so now we're going to look at um, our, uh, you know, before we do that, I just want to go back and say, um, you know, connecting the grain, of course, to, to Pesach, the idea of matzah. So matzah was actually seen uh, as a nomadic food, right? So uh, settled societies, permanent societies really ate bread, but nomadic societies ate pita or matzah, right? Because they didn't need time for it to rise. They didn't have to do as much of a process. They didn't need, you know, permanent settlement. So matzah can be seen as a bread of freedom. Um, it was also because slaves were paid in bread. So matzah not being bread was also seen as a symbol of uh, a food of, of freedom. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to our last Mecca Ray model, which is a model of his uh, garden. Okay, so before we leave this, I just wanted to go back to our original picture from 1920 of the archaeologist's first view of the room from Mecca Ray's tomb. And you'll now be able to recognize all these objects from our, our tour and our discussion. You can see the model of the garden on the upper right. You can see some of the boats that we saw, uh, one of the models. Now you may be saying to yourself, wait a second, we didn't see all these boats or all these things. Remember, half of them are in Egypt. We have, there were 24 models that were found in this room. We have, we have 11 or 12 and Egypt has the other uh, 12. Um, but now again, it really sees, you can see how these objects were found in a tomb, their importance to um, Egyptian life and how they bring all these things to light for us. Okay, so we're now moving from the very small scale of wooden models to the very large scale of sculptures uh, and sculptures of Pharaoh. 
So I'm gonna do my intro with this sculpture in the background, just so we all have something visual to look at. And the discussion we're gonna talk about now is who is the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Now that, that could be a whole two hour class in itself. It's a very, very, um, uh, interesting uh, subject to, to look into, and there are many opinions on that. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because, as we know, um, the, the Torah is not a history book. It's not a chronology book. We do get some um, dates or years from there, but again, it can't be used um, as a history book. And, and ancient Egyptian um, writing and records also cannot be used as a history book for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, the ancient Egyptians did not record history as other ancient cultures like uh, ancient Mesopotamia or Greece and Rome, who really did do historical recording. The ancient Egyptians, what they wrote down, what they recorded, what they kept track of was solely for the purpose of um, uh, promoting the gods and goddesses and the pharaohs. It was pretty much um, propaganda and they only wanted information to be recorded and remembered if it showed the gods and goddesses and pharaohs in a good light. Anything else, they didn't want it to be recorded or remembered. So we have to keep that in mind as we're looking at things. These are really objects that were made, you, made to uh, make the pharaohs and gods and goddesses look good. And then of course, things that people needed for their afterlife. Those were the purposes. Not, not for history, okay? So that the other difficulty in timing between looking at the Tanakh for dates and looking at ancient Egyptian um, artifacts for date is that the ancient Egyptians actually had a 10 day work week, uh, I'm sorry, 10 day week. So their timing is totally off from our timing, okay? So we're looking at a seven day week compared to a 10 day week. Okay, so keeping all that in mind, you'll understand why it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. But we're gonna give two ideas ideas tonight. There are many, many. I've, I've read at least five or six pharaohs who could have been, um, but we're going to just do, we're just going to uh, talk about two tonight. Okay, so the first one um, we're going to look at, we're looking right now at a sphinx. Um, now, as you might have noticed with the models that we were looking at, that all the people pretty much look the same. All the slaves look the same. There were no personalized features or individual features. And you will notice that about the sculptures also. If you look at the faces of the sculptures, we won't be able to tell who's who. And the Egyptians were not looking to personalize the faces, but they did let us know who the sculptures were. And if you've been looking at this carefully, you might have found some hieroglyphics, which tell us who this um, uh, uh, sculpture is supposed to be. So the hieroglyphics in the middle of the pause here, and this is a sphinx. Uh, of a pharaoh uh, whose name was Hatshepsut. She was actually a female pharaoh. Anyone who has children or grandchildren in sixth grade, if you ask them who was Hatshepsut, they probably can tell you. She was a very well-known female pharaoh and we are going to talk about her for a little. But first of all, just looking at the Sphinx, the Sphinx of course is the face of a pharaoh, the body of a lion to show how powerful the pharaohs thought they were like uh, lions uh, and um, Almost every pharaoh had a sphinx carved of themselves. As you're looking at these sculptures, by the way, notice they're carved out of stone. These were made 4,000 years ago. It's unbelievable the detail and the worksmanship of all these works of art. Think about the fact that these are the people who created them, artisans, artists, artisans, and sometimes slaves had no formal artistic training. They didn't go to art school. Uh, and they didn't have uh, art history to rely on. So, and they didn't, and they had very primitive tools. So putting all this together, it's, it's pretty mind boggling that they made all these things. So this is the Sphinx of Hatshepsut. Now you might be thinking, you know, she looks like a male in this, in this uh, uh, sculpture. She's wearing the false beard of male pharaohs. She's also wearing a headdress, but female pharaohs also wore the headdress, but they didn't wear, wear the false beard. So, uh, why is Hatshepsut presenting herself as a man? That's a very um, interesting story, which we're gonna talk about. So Hatshepsut, um, she was uh, the Pharaoh from 1479 to 1458 BCE. Those were her dates of being the Pharaoh. And that actually coincides with a source that we are going to look at now um, from Malachim Aleph. So we, here we have a source that tells us that um, in the 480th year after the Israelites left the land of Egypt in the month of Ziv, that is the second month in the fourth year of his reign over Israel, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. So this source from Malachim Aleph is telling us that
that uh, Shlomo built the uh, Beit HaMikdash in the fourth year of his reign, and that was 480 years after the Israelites left Egypt. So um, most people agree that the Beit HaMikdash was built around 966 BCE. If we add 480 years to that, we will get the year, we will get around the year of uh, 1446 BCE. Um, and that is during, that is actually when a Pharaoh named Tutmosis the third was the Pharaoh. Okay, so according to this source that would make Tutmosis the third, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, who is Tutmosis the third? That was actually the stepson of our Hatshepsut who we see here. So basically a little bit of background of Hatshepsut is she, her father was a Pharaoh. He was, her father was Tutmosis the first. Then she actually married her uh, half brother, who was Tutmosis II, and uh, Tutmosis II had a son, who was Hatshepsut's stepson, and that's Tutmosis III. Now, when Tutmosis II, who is Hatshepsut's um, husband, died, their stepson was her stepson was very young. So Hatshepsut decided, you know what? I'm going to rule until my stepson is old enough to rule. So she made herself pharaoh. She was not supposed to be pharaoh. She made herself pharaoh, and she ruled for 20 years. She was uh, actually. Um, so she was not supposed to be Pharaoh. So she had to really prove that she was worthy to be Pharaoh. And that's why, getting back to our question of why she appears as a male, that's why in most of her sculptures, she appears as a male. Um, I'm going to bring us back into the museum so we can see a room full of Hatshepsut sculptures uh, and see that how she portrayed herself. Okay, so we're now back in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in a room, this is a room full of Hatshepsut sculptures. So take a minute, look around the room, and I'm sure you'll notice a lot of things about these sculptures, which we'll hopefully um, talk about. So one thing you might notice, first of all, these are huge, huge sculptures uh, carved out of stone. You might notice that it's Hatshepsut appearing again like a male with a false beard. In these, she's leaning to give offerings to the gods and goddesses. Um, very large sculptures. Um, you might also be noticing that a lot of them are broken. Okay, so, um, have broken pieces, have cracks in them, have their face, parts of the face broken off. So you might be thinking, well, they're 4,000 years old, uh, things you know break in 4,000 years. But remember, these are made out of solid granite. So we have sculptures in the museum that are 5,000 years old and they're in perfect condition because if you don't bother a sculpture, then it can really last. So what happened to these sculptures? They, the reason they're in such bad condition and broken in so many places and missing parts is because when Tutmosis III came to power, <laughs> he was very angry at his stepmother that she had ruled for 20 years instead of him. So he had all of her sculptures destroyed, uh, broken to smithereens. Um, in fact, before he had them broken, he actually had them uh, destroy the faces first, because they believed in ancient Egypt, if you destroy a face, it's as if you destroy the person. So they were all destroyed. Not only that, Tutmosis III had his stepmother Hatshepsut erased from the list of kings, from the official list of kings. So from 1458 uh, BCE, when Hatshepsut died, until 1822 of the Common Era, nobody knew about Hatshepsut. She was erased from history. Uh, until archaeologists started digging, finding some pieces of sculpture, and realizing there's it, there's a missing part of history here. The reason I'm telling you that this whole story, it's very important, but it relates to our story as well. Because many people ask me, you know, I want to see evidence in the museum for the, the, the Israelites living in Egypt or the Israelites' exodus. And uh, I always say an absence of evidence does not mean that the event did not happen. Because as I said, the pharaohs controlled all information that got out and that was preserved for you know, history. And you know, as, as just as Tutmosis III had all this um, destroyed, there were, uh, there were pharaohs who didn't want any information to get out or any information to be created. It was all very controlled. Um, there are more answers to that, which we will get into later, but that is one of the answers as to why there is no uh, archeological evidence of the Israelites being in Egypt. Um, or of the Exodus. Okay, so as we had a few minutes to look at these really huge, larger than life sculptures, I want everyone also to think about, as we said, we're supposed to behold over door chayav adam l'rot etmo, at atzmo ki ilu hu yatsami So imagine, right, these sculptures were made in the uh, 1470s, 
um, BCE, that is when the Israelites were in Egypt, and perhaps um, suggesting that Hatshepsut was a pharaoh, one of the pharaohs of the oppression. Remember, the oppression lasts anywhere from 86, the Jews were slaves from anywhere from 86 to 116 years, so there were multiple pharaohs this, that during that time, but I'm proposing that Hatshepsut was the final pharaoh mm -hmm. of uh, of the oppression, of the, the slavery. So now imagine if you were a Jewish slave in Egypt and you saw these huge lifelike, huge, larger than life sculptures all over Egypt, Sphinx of the ruler, how scary that would be, how intimidating that would be. Um, and it really kind of puts all of this, uh, helps us to imagine. Now I did say that Hatshepsut, most of her sculptures, she appears as a male, including this one, but I've been hiding the other side of the room because we do have some sculptures where she appears as a female, uh, which is, you know, we do know she was a female from writing, but we also do have these sculptures where um, we can see she's wearing a dress, she's not wearing the false beard, uh, and she has a, a feminine look to her. Um, so we do have those. Now also notice on some of these sculptures, we never found the faces, we never found parts of them. That's why archaeological digs are still going on to this day because there's so many pieces and things that are still missing. But this does give us a feeling uh, that uh, of, of Hatshepsut being presented as a female pharaoh as well. Okay, so now we're going to go back to our, so we can see some of these images a little bit clearer. Um, uh, so this is this is me in the museum next to the Sphinx of Hatshepsut, just so you get an idea that uh, the size of it. Again, the museum, it is open for those who are comfortable coming to visit. Um, I uh, have, uh, especially now before Pesach and Cholamoid, a lot of uh, people interested in coming to see the collection and, and uh, I do private tours of the ancient Egyptian collection. Um, so this gives you a size of it. This is actually my daughter in the museum. Um, I drag my kids many years over Cholamoid. But again, this is an idea. I, I want to give you an idea of the size of these sculptures. Um, they're, they're really huge, um, larger than life. And again, to get the feeling of what it would feel like to be in Egypt with all these sculptures all over. They were out, they were everywhere. Um, and the feeling of, you know, someone's always watching you, making sure you're working, making sure you're supposed to be doing, uh, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, a few more, again, Hatshepsut appearing as a male with a beard. Again, as you're looking at these, remember these were carved out of solid stone using a hammer and a chisel, which is uh, really remarkable. I always say, I I'm not an artist, I have an art history background, but I always say even with the most advanced tools, uh, a laser, a crane, anything, I would not be able to create this. And they were doing it using a hammer and a chisel is really mind boggling. Also notice the broken parts, especially the face being broken. The idea that Tutmosis III was trying to wipe out Hatshepsut's memory and wipe, wipe her, you know, uh, re all references to her um, out of Egyptian history. Um, and then we have one more sculpture, which we saw um, where Hatshepsut appears more feminine. Again, all these sculptures have hieroglyphics on it. That's how we know who they are. They have hieroglyphics and we can also date them um, using carbon dating and also uh, where they were found. We can sometimes figure out whose sculptures they were. Okay, so now let's tie this into our sources. So I am I'm suggesting that Hatshepsut was the last uh, Pharaoh of uh, the, while the Israelites were slaves, based on the source from Lacham Aleph, but also I want to try and use some of the uh, psukim from, from Tanakh to try and back up my claim. So here we have, um, we say this at the Seder, So a long time after that, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites were groaning under the bondage and cried out, and their cry to help from their bondage rose up to God. So this just places us in um, gives us the perspective that uh, one king died, right? A king, the last king of bondage died. And then there was another king, uh, another Pharaoh who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So I am proposing based on the date from Malachim Aleph that the king who died here was Hatshepsut and the king who took over was Tutmosis III. And that is who, uh, that who was, was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Um, but let's look at a couple more sources. So we have the very famous, um, Pasuk from Shmot Aleph, Ayaka Mel Hadash, Amitraim, Asherlo Yadat Yosef. So there are many interpretations of who this new king was. Was it actually a new king? Was it a king who didn't know or pretended not to know the uh, who Yosef was? 
Um, there is an idea that this phraseology by Yaakam el Hadash um, indicates it was a usurper. The, this new king was someone who wasn't supposed to be king, but they made themselves king. And that would fit in with Hatshepsut, right? We said she was a usurper. She made herself uh, a pharaoh. By the way, uh, she was a very, very strong pharaoh. She didn't conquer countries because you had to be the head of the military. You had to be a male to conquer countries uh, as a head of the military, but she did increase um, trade in ancient Egypt and she and, uh, improved the economy tremendously. Okay, so that was Hatshepsut. So perhaps this is referring to usurper. Now our second uh, pasuk from uh, Shemot Aleph also, uh, So she commanded the midwives saying, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the birth stool. Uh, if it is a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. So it's a, interesting to think about, right? The Pharaoh obviously was very familiar with the birthing process. Um, and who would be more familiar with the birthing process than a female Pharaoh who she herself gave birth. Now, even though Tutmosis III was her stepson, uh, it wasn't her birth son, she, we know she had at least one child. She had a daughter, if not more. So she was very familiar with it. She would have been able to tell, describe this uh, birthing process, the Avnaim, the birth stool, and would have been familiar with it. And another thing is that, um, uh, if we think about the midwives were never, you know, punished for the fact that they didn't follow uh, Paro's decree. So if we think that perhaps um, a lot of people in the government, in, in the administration of Hatshepsut, were not happy that she made herself pharaoh, and maybe they weren't supporting her, and maybe they were undermining some of her uh, decrees or weren't enforcing them, that would fit into why the midwives were never punished um, for not uh, following the, the Pharaoh's decree. So that's uh, one way to look at who the Pharaoh of the Exodus is. And we do that through the dating from Malachim Aleph that we looked at, and also um, through some of the psukim um, that we were just looking at. But I'm sure as I've been talking, some of you have said, um, have been thinking, wait a second, we heard that Ramses II was the Pharaoh, Ramses the Great was a Pharaoh of the Exodus. And, uh, you know, uh, as a, an, for the, I guess, the entertainment industry, anyone who's seen um, the Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt, I think that they talk about Ramses the Great being the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, of course, I would not rely on a movie for, for my um, information, but they had to get that from somewhere. So where did that come from? So I'm going to give a little bit of a background of Ramses the Second and why that, that might be. But I want to just give you a visualization here. Um, this is actually, I traveled to Egypt in the... Um, in the 1990s. And um, this is actually pictures of me. This is me standing next to the, a sculpture of Ramses the Great, Ramses II. This is my friend who I traveled with. She's lying down next to the sculpture of Ramses II. Again, uh, an incredible visualization of these sculptures. They were huge, larger than life. Again, let's put us our, ourselves in Mitzrayim as slaves, seeing these sculptures around, these huge intimidating sculptures. Um, very scary. And uh, of course, the idea that someone's always watching you as a slave was a very scary idea. Also, having all these sculptures of pharaohs, and I will show you also sculptures of gods and goddesses, um, uh, uh, makes us understand why Moshe asked, said to Paro, we're going to leave Egypt to worship. The, you know, how could they worship with all these sculptures and 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 gods and goddesses everywhere? Um, it also shows us why the um, um, why the Egyptians found the Israelites so um, threatening, right? The Israelites believed in one God. They didn't believe in any of the Egyptian gods. They believed in one God, that idea of monotheism, the very uh, strange idea. And this whole I, thing that they didn't believe, that the Israelites didn't believe in ancient Egyptian gods and goddesses was very threatening uh, to the pharaohs. So it puts all these images, put all of this into um, context. So now, how can we say that Ramses II is the pharaoh of the Exodus? There are some people who date the Exodus to 1290 BCE, and that is when Ramses II was the king. Now, Ramses II is known as Ramses the Great for many reasons. He ruled for 67 years, which was uh, one of the longest ruling monarchs in any, uh, in any country's history. 
Um, he lived to be in his 90s, which at a time when the average lifespan was, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30, to live to your 90s was a, a very long time. Ramses II had mm -hmm. about 200 wives. He had over 100 children. He did many building uh, projects in Egypt. He was known as Ramses the Great for all of these reasons. Um, and again, many people date the Exodus to 1290 BCE. It's a little bit tricky with that source from Malachim. You have to shorten uh, um, some other, uh, uh, the, um, the uh, Israelite experience in Canaan. So it's, it's a little bit difficult with the dates, but there are both uh, rabbis and uh, rabbinical archeologists who do place the Exodus in 1290 BCE. Now we also have some sources that people refer to and use this as a proof that Ramses the Great was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So here we have two sources. Here's from Shmot Aleph. So we're going to say this in the Seder in a little over a week, right? So people read this. So first of all, we're talking about our taskmasters, which we saw in the uh, Meket Ray model, visualization of a taskmaster. And we're saying that the, that the Israelites build these cities for Paro, Pitom, and Ramses. So, oh, if they built a city named Ramses, then Ramses II, <laughs> Ramses the Great, must have been the Pharaoh. But that's a little bit difficult for a couple of reasons. First reason is, let's look at the next source from Breshit, which talks about Yosef. So we're going back in time to when Yosef settled his father and his brothers in the area of Goshen. So Goshen was actually in the region of Ramses. So there was a there was an area called Ramses, um, you know, um, oh, more than 100, 150 years before um, the, the Israelites were slaves. Okay, the other difficulty with saying that because it says Ramses, that they built Pitom and Ramses, then it was Ramses II, is because there were more than one Pharaoh named Ramses. There were actually either 11 or 13, differences of opinion, but there were many pharaohs named Rams, um, Ramses or Ramses. Um, Ramses the Great was the most well-known and the longest ruler, but there, were, there was a pharaoh that was called Ramses that ruled in Egypt for uh, over 230 years. So it's hard to pinpoint uh, saying that this is Ramses II. It could be referring to um, many different Ramses. Um, but again, there are archeologists and uh, biblical archeologists who do say that Ramses the Great was the Pharaoh of the Exodus um, based on the year 1290, which was during his, his reign. Um, okay, so now, before we leave this topic, some of you might be thinking, uh, you know, looking at that picture of me with Ramses, uh, thinking, but I thought you're not allowed to go to Egypt, right? We have source, we have sources in the Torah, right? We have over here, the Torah warned us in three places not to return to Egypt. Um, and we have the three sources here. Um, but think, thankfully, we have um, Rambam's Mishnah Torah, which tells us that um, it's, the, it's a, Really, it's a, it, referring to living in Egypt, not visiting there. So he says it's per permissible to return to Egypt to conduct business and commerce, to conquer other lands. It's only, the prohibition is only against residing permanently there. Okay, so there's no problem visiting. And actually there are many uh, biblical archeologists and rabbis in Israel who go to Egypt and have been there uh, recently, uh, right before Corona. And uh, it's not a problem. And so many of you might be thinking, wait, Rambam himself actually lived in Egypt. And we know there was a Jewish community in Egypt. There's the Cairo Geniza, there were shuls in, in Egypt. So there, there are many ways to talk about that. Some people say that the prohibition is only, um, it's only a, during the time of the Torah, it's only a biblical prohibition during that time. Other people say, as long as you um, you know, you are doing work there, it's okay. There are different ways around it. But I did see in, in the Rambam's writings that he did sign some of his letters uh, feeling guilty about living, about living in Egypt, even though he uh, had to leave Spain and that's why he fled there. Um, okay, so now we are going to move on to, we're gonna move on from, uh, away from the, who is the Pharaoh of the Exodus and look at um, another topic. Um, we're going to look, we're gonna go back into the museum and uh, we're gonna look at some uh, ancient Egyptian paintings. Okay, so we're back in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in one of my favorite hallways. And you'll see there are many, many paintings in this, hallways, in this hallway. Now, 
This, this is the area of the museum where these are not the original artifacts. It's the only, uh, these are the only artifacts that aren't original. And there's a very good reason for that. These are tomb paintings. Everything that you're looking here are tomb paintings. So we couldn't, uh, the museum obviously could not take the tomb walls and bring them to the museum. So I guess they did the next best thing in that they uh, sent artists along with archeologists, the artists sat in these tombs and these in these dark tombs and they copied the paintings exactly what they saw they copied exact replicas of these paintings now why are these so important as you're looking at them and again i know they're a little bit grainy and that's the technology um, but as you're looking at them you can certainly get an idea of what life was like in ancient egypt from these paintings um, you will see, as I said before, a lot of boats in these paintings. So it shows us the importance of boats, the importance of the Nile River. Um, you can see people, the way they're dressed, you know, the, uh, all the slaves that are in them. You can see a lot of women in these paintings and you see that women were important part of ancient Egyptian society. They were, um, uh, they probably had the highest standing in ancient uh, civilizations. They were, women could own land. They were uh, always, next to their husbands, maybe a little bit behind or shown a little bit smaller, but very important um, uh, parts of uh, uh, ancient Egypt society, ancient Egyptian society. By the way, you're, you're probably noticing that there's a sculpture in here also. This is the sculpture, here we have two of them. Uh, this is a sculpture of a goddess, and we know that because it's the face of an animal and the body of a human. And this is a uh, sculpture of the goddess called Sakhmet, and she was the goddess of plagues. Now, we know that there were a lot of plagues in ancient Egypt besides the 10 plagues. Plagues did happen. We have reference to that. And the fact that they had an, a goddess of plagues means that it was something that happened and they needed help with help understanding and help controlling. They believed, of course, that their gods would control that. So getting back to these paintings, um, just to point out a, um, a, a, a art history fact about them. Looking at these paintings, you'll notice that they are all, they painted people in profile. Um, so you only see half of the face, but sculptures were done fully frontal. So the sculptures, we see the full face, but the um, paintings, we only see um, the, uh, the side view, a profile view. So I just, again, wanted to show you these paintings to give you an idea of Go, go, if you spend time in this hallway, you can imagine what life was like in ancient Egypt. Again, behold Dor Vador. These are, these are paintings that were done about ancient Egyptian life. Okay, so now we have, uh, this is actually a painting of a pharaoh. Um, and again, lots of details, paintings of chariots. Um, so I'm gonna show you two of these paintings a little bit closer up so we can, um, get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so this is one of my favorite paintings. And this is actually a painting of an ancient Egyptian um, artisan's workshop. Okay, so here we see uh, slaves and artisans working to create works of art for uh, someone's tomb. So what do we notice in this painting? Take a minute just to look at it. You'll notice people are making jewelry, they're making furniture, all the things that would be prepared for someone's tomb. Uh, who's that someone? Well, the person who's the biggest is the most important person. That's how they show importance in these paintings. The bigger the person, the more important they are. So it's it's his, his, his tomb. Um, and these are all the people working to create objects from it. So now let's get a close up of this painting painting here. So we can see the jewelry that they made. We can see they weighed um, gold. Um, we can see, by the way, notice his face is scratched out. That's not uh, an accident. Somebody didn't like this person and they scratched out his face. And even though these are copies, the museum artist copied the original paintings exactly. So if some if paint was etched out in the original painting, that's how the artist um, painted it, exactly how it looked in 1920. Okay, let's look at another detail. I love this detail. This is someone making a sphinx. And look at the, look at the tools he's using, a rock and a nail, uh, a, a very primitive hammer and chisel to create a sphinx. It's really uh, pretty, pretty remarkable. They're also creating uh, all the things that people would be buried with, um, furniture, jewelry, uh, all kinds of things that they're creating in this in this painting. Again, um, everyone's in profile. Everyone uh, and and we can't see any individualized features, right? We have no clue who these people are. It doesn't matter, according to the Egyptians. Um, the only purpose for these paintings is so that uh, when people came back to life, they would have all their sleeves, they would have all their objects, they would have everything in the painting would come to life. And then th this is just a painting again from that room to show 
uh, everyday life in ancient Egypt, how people um, uh, tilled the soil, what tools they had, what animals they worked with, uh, what food they were um, getting from their uh, crops. Um, again, we have a uh, a man and a woman here. You can see, even though the woman is behind, she is important. She's, you know, almost as tall as him. Okay, and then this is just, this is me in the museum recently. Um, again, I want you to see that the paintings are in color, um, very, uh, um, very detailed. Again, a lot of paintings with boats in them to show the importance of the Nile River, the importance of boats in ancient, uh, in ancient Egypt. Um, Okay, so we're going to escape from here. And I just want to show you one more thing from the Hatshepsut room, one more thing, uh, object to tie us to the story uh, in the Haggadah. So here we, we're in the museum. These are great galleries just full of chock full of ancient Egyptian objects. Um, but here, some of you might notice what we are looking at, and we're looking at a basket. So People always ask me, is that Moshe's basket? No, it's not because uh, the date is much earlier actually on this basket, but it gives us a visualization of what a basket looked like in ancient Egypt and how it would be possible to fit a baby in here. And this basket actually does float. It's made out of a woven material, woven very strong uh, and it's reinforced so there wouldn't, no water wouldn't get in here. Um, and again, it's a visualization to help us visualize things that we have learned about um, about uh, ancient Egypt and about the Israelite experience in ancient Egypt. Okay, so now we are going to go to our final room in the museum, uh, which is a room that many of you might be familiar with. M many of you might have been there. If not, uh, if you're comfortable visiting on Pesach, after Pesach, it's uh, a room that makes you feel like you're in Egypt. That's the point of this room. So we're in the room that houses the Temple of Dendro. The Temple of Dendro is way back here. It is an ancient Egyptian temple. It's one of our newer objects. It's only about two thousand about 2030 years old. Um, but as we're in this room, I want us all together to imagine we're in the museum and imagine we're in Egypt because that's how you're supposed to feel in this room. So again, our, our, our sentence that we keep coming back to from the Haggadah, So here we are in Egypt. You can see the Nile River. You can see uh, sculptures of pharaohs. You can see the ancient Egyptian temple. The windows are slanted to look like pyramids. Uh, light is coming in from Central Park, so you feel like the climate of ancient Egypt. And let's um, walk around a little bit together in this room. On our left side, we have more sculptures of Sakmet, the goddess of the plague, the plagues, um, the, the Egyptians would appeal to to save them from plagues. We're going to go down this hallway. On the left side, there are pictures, the story of the Temple of Dendro when it was in Egypt. I will show you these pictures much closer up so we can really see them. But let's go onto the platform and see, this is where the Sphinx, Sphinx of Hatshepsut is in this room. And here we have a view of the Temple of Dendro from the side. You can see there are two buildings. There's a, a entryway or a uh, an archway, and this is the temple. Now, ancient Egyptian temples, the the priests would go inside, but everyone else would worship outside. Again, the idea that all these temples were in um, Egypt um, made it very difficult for, uh, and one of the reasons why Moshe would have wanted the Jews to leave um, to, um, to worship Hashem um, because of the, all these uh, temples and all these sculptures, like those sculptures of Sakmet, of the gods and goddesses. Now on the temple are lots of carvings. We'll get a little closer here. This is, and we can see faintly that there's carvings of gods, uh, uh, gods and goddesses and pharaohs giving offerings to the gods and goddesses. Um, I will show you these a little bit closer, but again, I just want you to get a feel for this room. Uh, you're supposed to feel like you're in ancient Egypt. That's how the room was created. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to our pictures so we can see, uh, we're gonna see some of these things a little bit closer up and a little bit more detailed. Okay, so here the picture looks just like the virtual tour. We're in, uh, we're in the room. Now, how did we get uh, this temple? Why do we have this ancient Egyptian temple in the museum? What's the story behind it? So let's see what it looked like in Egypt. So we know it was actually there. This is a picture that you saw on the wall. Um, I'm just showing it to you a little bit clearer. This is a picture of the Temple Dender in Egypt in 18... Uh, around the 1870s, this picture was taken, or 1880s. So you see the Temple of Dendor. Can't really see the Nile River. It's kind of back here, pretty far away. 
Um, this is a, it's called the Temple of Dendor, by the way, because it was built in uh, an, a region called Dendor, um, and it was built to the goddess Isis. So this is a Temple of Dendor again. Uh, you can see some of the carvings. Now I show this um, picture from the uh, late 1800s because I want to talk about the amazing architecture of the Temple of Dendor, but everybody always looks at it and says, what's that English writing on there? So unfortunately, when people came to visit the Temple of Dendor in Egypt in the early 18, mid 1800s, there was no security and there was no, um, uh, there was no one protecting the art and people um, spray painted their name and carved their names into the Temple of Dendor, unfortunately. Some of it we got rid of, the carvings we could not. Um, but that does, um, uh, that happened in Egypt uh, in the 1800s. Okay, so here we have the Temple of Dendor with the uh, carvings of the pharaohs giving offerings to the gods and goddesses, whoops. Now we see what happened. So in the 1960, uh, the Aswan Dam was built and it led to the um, Nile River overflowing um, and it started to, um, it started to damage a lot of these temples and um, um, and architectural elements that were um, built near the Nile River. Okay, so here we have the Nile River overflowing on the Temple of Dendor a little bit, um, but unfortunately, sometimes the Nile River would really flow. And here, it's almost the the Temple of Dendor is almost completely submerged by the Nile River. So this was a problem because these ancient Egyptian artifacts were getting ruined. Uh, they're getting flooded. So in 1965. Um, the Egyptian government appealed to UNESCO and to the United States and asked for help um, curbing the waters from the Aswan Dam. And the, um, uh, the American government sent help, they sent engineers, they sent help to, uh, to control the waters of the Nile River. And Egypt was very thankful. So they said, we wanna thank you, th thank you. We wanna give you a gift of the Temple of Dendor for your, for your country. So now of course, Many museums wanted the Temple of Dendor, especially Smithsonian's. There are all these interesting um, newspaper articles from the 19, 1965, 1966, which talk about the, De uh, the Dendor Derby, where all these different museums were having a contest to present the best plan that they would be able to win the Temple of Dendor. So the Metropolitan Museum of Art said they would create a room, which we were just in together uh, a few minutes ago, they said, we'll create a room where you feel like you're in Egypt. And they won the Dendor Derby contest. They won the Temple of Dendor and it was awarded to them in 1967. So now how did they get the Temple of Dendor, which is made of over 300 um, blocks of stone weighing more than a ton each? How did they get it to um, New York? So first of all, they had to take it apart brick by brick. Of course, beforehand they took pictures, they made architectural drawings and all that. Took it apart brick by brick, they sent it over by boat, and then it was brought by truck to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, all the bricks, and it was rebuilt. So here's the outside of the Met before they had that wing built onto it. You can see that they're building on a wing to the uh, Egyptian um, wing of the museum. Here we have the Temple of Dendor, um, in the museum. And here we have what it looks like today. Um, this is a night picture where it's really well lit up and you can see all these carvings that I was referring to. Um, and again, uh, seeing this, the temple, this is one of many, many temples and seeing this um, uh, again brings to light the idea of why the Israelites were so threatening to the Pharaohs because they wouldn't worship in these temples, they wouldn't worship the gods. Uh, and that was very, very threatening at that time. Um, here's a close up of a Pharaoh giving an offering to a God and a goddess. Again, the goddess is represented as half animal, half human. Uh, they believe the gods and goddesses had powers of both humans and animals. Um, a couple more details. Again, we have all this information because of the hieroglyphics that are carved into it. So we know all of this information. And our last image is again, me in the museum. What the museum is doing now, this is something they've been doing for about the past year or so, is that they have a laser light shining onto the Temple of Dendor. It doesn't, it doesn't damage it, but it shows us that the Temple of Dendor was originally painted many colors. It was painted red, blue, yellow, green. Um, and we don't have those colors anymore. Uh, first of all, time, the elements, the water, all of those things. Also uh, paint back then was made out of natural dyes. Um, so for all those reasons, we don't have the original paint anymore, but the museum 
through carbon dating and x-rays and different things knows the original pigments and they're trying to recreate it here. So when you visit now, you will be able to see some of the colors that uh, and how it actually would have looked like originally. Um, so I hope that everyone um, got a feeling, a little bit of a feeling of what life was like in ancient Egypt. And when you're sitting at the Seder and saying our words, behold, Dorador, Chayav Adam Lirot at Atzmok Ki'ilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim, that you can visualize some of these things and a little bit be able to have the feeling of what it might have been like um, to be an Israelite in ancient Egypt. So thank you very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna end my program here. And I know I see there are a number of, of the chat is lighting up. So I want to I want to get to those questions and anyone who has questions. Um, so I'm gonna stop my share so uh, I can look at the questions and uh, try and answer them. Okay, so uh, could Mekaray have been the pharaoh at the time of Abraham? Um, well, so Mekaray wasn't a pharaoh. He was an important official in ancient Egypt, but he wasn't a pharaoh. Could he have lived? I mean, if we if we date it, yeah, the 1980s BCE, uh, 300 years before. So again, depending on dating and timing, which I explained is not perfect, um, possibly could have been around that time. Um, did the rooms come in a set to be put together into Mecca Ray's estate or as separate rooms? They were separate. They were all separate uh, models. Each one is, was a separate wooden model of different areas of Mecca Ray's estate. Um, okay. So uh, someone so wrote, my family and I were in the ancient Egyptian se section of the Met during winter break and we saw gold death jewelry, yes, and sandals from the tomb of one. It was actually a Pharaoh's wife. It was actually the wives of Tutmosis III, who I said was a Pharaoh of the Exodus. It's very interesting that uh, those gold, that gold jewelry. Um, the informational card said that the names were likely Semitic and theorized that these wives were Israelites. Um, it is, it's a possibility. Again, as you said, they're all theories because we don't have, we don't have that exact information or um, evidence. Okay, is there, uh, is there evidence of the Israelites being in Mitzrayim? So, okay, uh, it's, that's a very long question to answer. As I said, there's not a lot of evidence for many reasons. First of all, one of them is the whole area that we know of as Goshen, where the Israelites lived, is all completely underwater. It's been underwater for many years. So even if there were some artifacts, they might be lost. Um, by the way, um, all these things that we're looking at and all the you know, millions of objects, that's only a fraction of the objects that were created in ancient Egypt. I've been told that up to 80% um, of objects are still lost. They're underwater. They haven't been found yet. They're still being looked for in archeological digs. So there's still information to come. So lack of evidence does not mean that it didn't happen. But uh, if you want to read a very interesting book and an interesting um, uh, theory, this book by Rabbi Josh Berman, Ani Mamin, um, is uh, he theorizes that Ramses the, the Great was the Pharaoh of the Exodus, and he actually uses evidence from Ramses' um, uh, uh, throne se uh, settlement, his uh, how they um, encamped, I'm sorry, his throne encampment. He says that was actually the basis of the setup of the Mishkan. And he says that Az Yashir was actually based on a song, uh, a war song of Ramses II, and he details it. Very interesting. So that is, might not be archeological evidence, but it is some written evidence with a tie-in. So that's very interesting. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of archeological evidence to the Israelites being in Egypt. Again, that doesn't mean that, uh, obviously doesn't mean, you can't say that lack of archeological evidence means that something didn't happen. And I you know, uh, 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 proved that through the Hatshepsut incident and um, other things. So, but definitely the Met is uh, hypothesizing on that. Um, okay. Okay, right. Okay, so that, right, Ramses and Ramses, okay, there's slight, slight uh, difference in, uh, in, the, in the pronunciation. Okay, it seems there was a region, um, Ramses, and then a city built by a similar name. Note the slight, right, the different uh, uh, vowelizations. Okay, right, so perhaps the city was named for a, a pharaoh named Ramses, but we don't know that it was Ramses the Great, because there were 11 pharaohs named Ramses. Um, so we don't know that it's named after that Ramses. Um, okay, thank you very much for all of these comments.
Um, Alana Kaplan, so she lives in Teaneck. What's the significance? Oh, the significance of depicting a pharaoh as a sphinx, um, really to show their power, right? They believe that that lions were like the power, powerful animals. So it was to show that a pharaoh was powerful, as powerful as a lion, a human and a lion, a, a pharaoh and a lion put together. It was a symbol of, of power. Um, why not erase the name rather than the face? Um, oops, I think we have some people who are unmuted, which is fine if you want to ask a question, but if you have background noise, just please keep muted. Um, okay. Why not erase the yourself. Why not erase the name rather than erase the face? Uh, interesting question. They believe that if you erase the face, you erased a person's memory. Uh, I guess the face was a powerful representation of a person more than more than the name even. Um, but in the in the case of Hatshepsut, and by the way, it wasn't just Hatshepsut that a lot of her sculptures were destroyed. A lot of pharaohs, if they came to power and didn't like the previous pharaoh, they would destroy their sculptures also. That's why we have so many uh, broken sculptures in, in the museum, broken pharaoh sculptures in the museum. Um, okay, great. Let's see lots of, is a scratch out painting actually a painting? Was a scratched out painting actually a painting of Hatshepsut? Um, no, those paintings that we looked at that were scratched out, it wasn't Hatshepsut. Um, it was other people, but again, it shows that, uh, again, anyone who came to power that didn't like the person behind them, before them, they would scratch out their face in a painting if they could get to it, or they would uh, destroy their face in a sculpture. Um, any indication Egyptians attributed at least some of the Mako to the goddess of the plagues? Yes. Yes, because they they believe that if their pharaohs were ang if their gods and goddesses were angry at them, right? Like if their god was angry with them, the Nile River was very low. If the goddess Sakhmet of the plagues was angry with them, she could bring a plague onto them. And we have we do have historical references to plagues in ancient Egypt, to <laughs> locust plagues, to those things happening. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly if the if Sakhmet was angry, uh, any indication in the Torah that they attributed? Oh, somewhere. any indication in the Torah. Not that I know of, not that I know of. Okay, so someone says the Torah refers to king, not queen. Does that not knock out Hatshepsut from being Pharaoh? Okay, possibly, but again, um, uh, it, it's, um, remember that Hatshepsut presented herself as a male Pharaoh in most of her sculptures. I don't know what the average Egyptian knew about her in terms of if she was a male or female Pharaoh, that I don't know. Remember the sculptures they're seeing of her were that she was represented as a male. They didn't see her in person. Uh, and the sculptures where she appears feminine, by the way, would have been in the palace. They would have been in indoor spaces. Those other sculptures were outdoors. So it is possible that people thought that that Pharaoh was a male Pharaoh. Um, and I think also, uh, yeah, that's, that, that is definitely the case. Okay. Um, let's see, we have a lot of, uh, okay. Were the boats restored by the museum or just cleaned up for display? Okay, interesting question. Um, uh, museum practices have changed a little bit over time. There was a, a school of thought earlier on in the early 1900s that sculpture should be um, fixed up so that they looked as, as much as possible like the originals. Um, so the museum did do that a little bit. Um, now the theory is that you leave things pretty much as they're found. Um, so the museum did restore, they, they didn't, uh, they actually boats were in very good condition, even though pieces were knocked out of them, they were in good condition. The paint was in good condition. Um, so they did have to put them back together and maybe uh, fix a little bit, but they were that's pretty much uh, how they were found. They were restored a little bit, but not, not that much. They were definitely um, put back together from how they were found. Um, do the Tel Amarna tablets shed light on the Exodus? Okay, yes. So we do have the Tel Amarna tablets. We do have um, a couple of the Amarna letters in the Met. Um, those are from around the period of 1353 to 1336. So again, it depends on how we're dating the is, uh, Israelites being in Egypt. If we're going with the date according to Malachim Aleph, then that is not the time of the Israelites being in Egypt. That would actually refer to when they were already in um, 
um, the land of, of Canaan. Um, but we do have a reference to the Israelites in a uh, steal from um, uh, Minerta, but that's from much later. Uh, that's not from when the Israelites would have been in Egypt. That's when they already would have been in Canaan, but it does refer to a group called Israelites. So we do have uh, um, an Egyptian uh, steel or a rock um, that does have the word Israelites on it, but it's from a later time period. So it's not from when the Israelites were in Egypt. Um, Okay, let's see. I have one more comment here that I have to read. It's a little bit long. According to the Bible, the aim of the Israelites was to enter. The aim of the Israelites was to enter Canaan until the end of Ramses' reign. The Egyptian army was stationed in Canaan. It does not seem logical that the Israelites would desire to enter a land controlled by the Egyptian army. The Pharaoh of the Exodus would be Ramses, who reigned at a time when the Egyptian forces were removed. Okay, so there, there. Again, there are at least five possibilities to what people suggest to the fair of the Exodus. There is a very strong group of people, including Rabbi Josh Berman and others who believe that Ramses the Great, Ramses II, was the Pharaoh. And again, that information that I was saying based on Ramses um, uh, tent uh, encampment and based on his song that he wrote over one of his conquests that the uh, that the, um, the 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 Israelites took actually appropriated language from Ramses um, records to use for Az Yashir and, and, and appropriated the setup of his uh, um, encampment, his throne encampment for the basis of the Mishkan. So there are different ideas that people have presented that Ramses II, Ramses the Great was the fair of the Exodus, including what you're saying here. So that is one opinion, but there are a lot of other opinions, including Professor um, Yoel Elitzur in Israel, who uh, goes strong, believes strongly that it was Tutmosis the third who was the fair of the Exodus. So it depends, you know, you, you can read both, you can think about it, you can uh, decide what makes more sense to you, but there are, there are um, archeologists, there are biblical scholars who are strong about both, uh, about both possibilities. Um, okay. Wow. I'd like to thank Ilana for a uh, fascinating and very enlightening presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yosef, and thank you, B'nai Ashurin, for hosting this uh, event tonight. Our pleasure. Chag kasher v'sameach to all. Chag kasher v'sameach. Bye-bye. Thank you. This was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Thanks for coming. <laughs> hey, Jake. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you again, Ilana. I mean, good night, Nessie. Thank Yessie. you so Yessie much for putting this together for us. Much appreciated. Okay, Betty. Great. Is this recorded and available to view it at a later it's time? It's recorded. It will be available. Okay, great. Okay. Lila Tov, everybody. Lila Tov. Lila Tov.